um, this week we will be learning about the book of uh, Titus. Okay, so before we could uh, get into what the book of Titus uh, has to speak about, I'll just try to understand a little bit about Titus. I think we know this is written by uh, Paul. Now, epistle in those times, we call it as a letter. So this was a letter that was uh, uh, written by Paul. And to whom is he writing? He's writing to Titus. We'll try to understand as we go down the chapters, who was Titus actually? And then when we look into the order of uh, the book Titus in the Bible, it, it stands at 56th place. And then we look into New Testament because it is a book in the New Testament. 17th book is the uh, Titus. And then Titus has three chapters. Okay, So this is a general understanding. I really don't want to get into the history of it because I'm not sure whether the history is right or not. So now we'll just move into a little bit summary of the uh, chapters that are there in Titus. Okay, So there are three chapters. Uh, chapter one, we will try to understand about the instructions on how to appoint the elders or bishops. That, that's what we will be talking about. And then chapter two talks about the admonitions or the um, instructions that were given by Paul to Titus to tell to those aged men and aged women and also to the young men and the, the servants. And then in chapter three, we will be understanding now chapter three is a combination of chapter one and chapter two. Now that is the admonition. So that is a reminder that is being given to the people in Crete. So we call them as Cretans. And a little bit uh, at the end point of this letter, at the conclusion of this letter, we find that some admonitions or some instructions were also given to Titus. So we'll go little by little from each chapter, looking into the summary of this uh, chapters. The first chapter, okay, chapter one of Titus. Now this is summarized as instructions on how to appoint the elders or bishops, okay? So firstly, when we look into chapter one and verse one, we find that Paul is actually introducing himself. Uh, something very fascinating about this book or something very fascinating about what uh, Paul uh, has taken the idea is now basically when we write letters whenever we write letters formal letters be it any letters that we write there is a format to follow. first we we want to understand from whom we are getting the letter so we find that Paul is very uh, order he's doing it in a very orderly manner firstly he's trying to introduce himself then he is addressing to the person that he's going to speak to and then finally, we find that he, he has a body matter to write. And then there is a conclusion to this letter. So in his introduction, what is uh, Paul trying to introduce himself is, he wants to introduce himself as servant of God. Now, mostly whenever we try to introduce ourselves, we say, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so. But here we find that Paul is introducing himself as a servant of God. And from verses 1 to 3, we clearly see how he is introducing himself. He's saying, uh, so and so Paul, he's the servant of God. And then he has hope in the, he is a person who is having hope in the eternal life. And that is how he's trying to introduce himself. He says that he's also acknowledging the truth. Now, most of the times we all have the truth, but it takes time for us to acknowledge the truth. But what Paul is saying confidently is, I have acknowledged the truth. That is how he is trying to introduce himself to that person to whom he is addressing in this letter. And then verse 3, here we get to understand why Peter, uh, Paul has actually chosen to be a preacher. Now, basically, in the times when Jesus was there on this earth, Jesus used this process of preaching in order to manifest the word of God. So that is how maybe in third ch uh, chapter 3, I'll just read it briefly but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now, this is a succeeding uh, verse of chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter uh, verse 2. So, he's saying Jesus himself has taken up that responsibility or he has taken up that particular role of preaching, manifesting the word of God in the way of preaching. So, therefore, he has chosen to be a preacher taking the example of Christ. So that is how he has introduced himself, that he is a servant of God. He is, he, he, he is acknowledging the truth of God and he has become a, a preacher or he has chosen himself to be a preacher all because 
Christ himself uh, chose himself to be a preacher. And then the second portion of uh, Titus uh, chapter 1, from verse 4, in verse 4, we find Paul addressing to a person. Now, this person's name is Titus. Now, the um, over here, when we read uh, verse 4, it says, To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, peace from God the Lord, and Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so from here, now this verse says that they were already together. Now, basically, we write letters to those whom we know or maybe to those uh, with whom we, we have lived with. So with this, we understand that Paul and Titus had lived together for a certain period of time. Now, uh, when, we, when we talk that Paul is actually writing letter to Titus, it means Paul is in another place and Titus was in another place. And there was something that Paul wanted to tell uh, Titus. So he's addressing Titus as his own son after common faith. Now, basically, whenever somebody is writing letter to us, we want to uh, see that dear or dearest. We don't like somebody just saying hi, so and so. And uh, to see this, that Paul is calling Titus as his own son, I'm sure he would be very excited to hear this from him. So that is how Paul is addressing Titus. And then when we move down to the next uh, verse, chapter 5, I'm sorry, uh, verse 5. Now, uh, Paul is actually writing to uh, Titus with a purpose. There is a very uh, challenging purpose for Paul to write to Titus. Okay. So now we'll try to understand from where Paul is actually writing. So like I've made a mention, Titus is in one place and Paul is in another place. And we see that in chapter 3 and verse 12, maybe I put up that verse for you, and I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis. This means that Paul is there already in Nicopolis, and then Pete, uh, Titus is in another place. Okay, And where is Titus? Titus is actually in a place called Crete. How do we know that uh, Titus is in in the, the place called Crete, chapter uh, verse 5 says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. So Paul is writing to Titus and saying, For a purpose I have left you in Crete. So um, when we look into um, a little bit of Crete, Crete is an island, island that is uh, present in the southern Greek, uh, Greece area. And then both of them, Paul and, uh, I'm sorry, Paul and Titus has ministered in Crete. But for some sort of re uh, reason, Paul had to go to Nicopolis. So therefore, he left Titus over there. There was a purpose for Paul to leave Titus over there. So he goes to Nicopolis. After uh, analyzing the kind of life that the people in Crete uh, were following, he had to write a letter to Titus with a great purpose. Okay, So we'll look into what is that purpose of uh, Paul writing to Titus and why Titus was left in Crete. Actually, maybe both of them would have gone to uh, Nicopolis together, but for some reason, Titus was left behind. So we'll try to understand why Titus was left behind and what was the reason for uh, Paul to write a letter to Titus in regard to the people that were there in Crete. Okay, so now... Priorly, when Paul and Titus was, were there in Crete, when they were ministering in Crete, Paul had a conversation with the Christians. Now, these are those people. All of them were Christians. But among these Christians, there were some that were, uh, that were uh, believing in circumcision, and there were some that were following the Jewish fables. Now, Jewish fables are all those myths, the belief system that usually the Jewish people follow. And I'm sure we all know what are those type of customs or myths that the Jewish people have. And then uh, if we go a little bit into the history of what God has done for us, he has sent his son in order to do away with that law of Moses. But we also know many don't accept uh, that uh, particular uh, what to say, they don't really accept that the law of Moses was done away with. So such were the people of Crete. And then while um, Paul was there with these Cretans, he had a conversation with them. 
and in his, in his conversation with those uh, people of wheat one of the one of the uh, persons or one of the people that were talking to Creed themselves testified of themselves i'll just read down what is uh, the testimony or what they have testified of themselves it is there in chapter 1 verse 12 one of themselves even a prophet of their own said the creations are always liars evil beasts and slow bellies okay so this was what the one of the prophets we we are not sure the bible doesn't mention whether this is a, prop, a prophet of god or uh, what type of prophet this was but he happened to uh, get this testimony and paul understands he knows by the way uh, by the particular period of time that he has been with the people of Crete, he understood whatever they have testified on, of themselves was really true. So you find in chapter uh, verse uh, 11, 10 and 11, how unruly those Christians were. They were vain talkers, deceivers, liars, evil beasts and slow bellies like they have already said. How Paul tried to under understand this verse he understood that they were not able to accept the truth. They were not able to accept that God has sent his son to do away with this law of Moses. So based on what is what was happening among the Christians that were there in Crete, Paul had this burden. He had the burden of telling, um, what to say, Titus to appoint leaders. He knew that there was deception happening. He knew that there was false teachings going on in the uh, island of Crete. So therefore, he wanted to bring a change. He wanted everybody to know what is the truth, the exact truth. And then a little more uh, about the Christians' word. Uh, you see in uh, verse 16, that is the last verse of chapter 1, it says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work a reprobate. So this is what Paul has identified. Now, they, they did not say that they profess to know God and then they are not following. But this was what Paul analyzed with the uh, in that particular period of time that Paul lived among them. He understood this is how they worship God. Now, uh, generally, we, we have this, um, what to say, in Isaiah and all, their lips are just praying. We, we just praise God with our lips lives but our hearts are far away from him that was the kind of christians that were there in crete so therefore he had that burden he wanted to tell uh, titus to bring a change in that particular people now before titus uh, paul could move away from crete to nicopolis he already made titus an elder now that is uh, proven or uh, we can see in chapter 5 as i had appointed the go and ordain elders in every city that is what chapter 5 says so we understand over here titus was already elected as an elder and paul wanted titus to select the elders or to elect the elders and they're supposed to have some particular attributes there has to be some qualities and those people who have those qualities alone are supposed to be appointed as elders now this was all based on the testimony that the prophet has given this was also based upon the analy analysis that paul has done over the creation so we'll try to understand um paul what he's telling uh, titus and how he's expecting titus to select the elders or to select the bishops maybe in those times we call them as bishops in our uh, modern times we could also call them as pastors right so pastors or elders those working in the church, those who are called to take up the responsibility of God. There are few attributes that Paul is saying. Let them have this attributes. When you are going to appoint elders in that particular island of Crete, they have to have all these attributes. So verse 6 to 9 gives us the attributes that a particular person is supposed to have in order to be elected as an elder. So we see they're blameless. Blameless, we all understand. They're not supposed to hold anything over anybody. Neither should anybody hold anything against this particular person. They are supposed to be stewards. Now, stewards are those persons who take up that responsibility of the uh, God's uh, work. Now, most of the times in uh, churches and all, now in, um, of course, in ancient uh, churches, even now, 
we have these elders or pastors or bishops who try to have ownership over the church. That is what they try to look into. But what God is trying to say is through Paul, let them not go into that uh, case of becoming an, uh, what to say, expecting for an ownership. They're supposed to be a steward. So steward is that particular person who is completely dedicated to take up that responsibility of the church without expecting any kind of, um, uh, what to say, benefits out of that. So that is another thing. And then he must be husband of one wife. So here, when you say husband of one wife, it doesn't mean, Paul doesn't mean to say that every elder who is going to be elected should be married. They can be married or they might not be married just in case if they are married, they are supposed to have only one wife. And then faithful children. Now, uh, usually you want to look into the ability of an elder by looking into how the, the children of that elders are. So that is what Paul is trying to tell Titus. Let them uh, look into the ability of how well they're able to train up their children. And if those children are found to be faithful, those uh, that particular person can be elected as an elder because he will be, he will be able to have that ability to uh, guide and guard those individuals that will be there in the, the church or in the sanctuary. So that is what it means to say that the bishop or the elder to be should have faithful children. And then he's supposed to have hospitality, lover of good men, Sober, sober uh, refers to he is, he is supposed to have a very clear thinking. Okay, Now, when we say very clear thinking, God himself says, do not be lukewarm. You cannot be cold. You cannot be hot. You, you have to be one. So that is how an elder should be. Ye should be a, nay, nay should be nay. So that is how uh, Paul is saying, check for those individuals who are of that particular clarity in thinking. And then they're supposed to be just holy, temperate, and then holding fast faithful word now when we say holding fast to the faithful faithful word this refers to that they be very confident in what they say now being confident doesn't just simply mean that they can say whatever they would like to but that has to have a, a proof from god or that has to have a permission granted by god this is what they're supposed to say or that is what they're supposed to inform it to the other individual so this is how uh, Paul is saying, if you find these qualities in some individuals that are there in Crete, you may appoint them as elders or leaders. And then he is also he also tells Titus, this is not how a bishop is supposed to be. How should a, bis a bishop not be? He is not supposed to be self-filled, meaning he is not supposed to be a selfish man or a selfish woman. He is not supposed to get very angry too soon. He is not supposed to be given to wine. I think we all know it. God says, touch not, taste not. So this refers to anything that can harm our body. So therefore, he says, that person is not supposed to be uh, giving himself to wine. He is not supposed to be a striker. Neither should be should he be given to fill the lakar. Now, when you say fill the lakar, this is related to gaining money or earning money from different ways, different ways that are actually illegal in the country. So these are the qualities that are not supposed to be there in a bishop. So these are the advices that are being given to Titus in order to select an elder in the creed. So that's what that is what chapter one is talking about. Writing to Titus, addressing him, and then giving him uh, telling him what is the purpose of his writing and how he's supposed to select the elders in the island of Crete. Then we move on to chapter two. Now, chapter 2 gives instructions to the aged men, the aged women, the young men, and then the servants. Now, what Paul, the idea of Paul over here is, he is not just uh, particular about those elders. He also wants to discipline or disciple every gender or every age group of individuals that were living in Crete. He do not want to leave out anybody. So, therefore, he is writing in his letter and stating these are those that you're supposed to inform it to the uh, people that are there in the grief, uh, I mean, in Creed, and message should be passed on to every individual, okay? And then uh, chapter two begins with the qualities that are supposed to be there in an aged man. This is what the, I'm sorry, this is what Titus is supposed to instruct the aged man. 
instruct the age men that they're supposed to be sober, they're supposed to be grave, temperate, sound in faith, charity, patience. Now, the reason why these aged men are supposed to have these qualities, the purpose of this is so that they will be able to teach the younger ones. That is what the Bible says. Maybe in um, chapter 2, verse 6, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse uh, Okay, 6 and uh, 7, we see over there how the aged men who has all these qualities will be able to train up their younger men. So therefore, he, Titus is supposed to tell all the aged men to con uh, have all these attributes. So that is the admonition that is being given to the aged men in verse 2. And then to the aged women, we have uh, the verses beginning from 3 to 5. What, what are all the qualities that the aged women are supposed to have? They're supposed to be holy. Okay? That is a requirement. And then they're not supposed, they're not, they're not supposed to be false accusers. So false accusers might be not to bear false, uh, false witness. That is what uh, Paul is trying to say. And then these women also are not supposed to be given, uh, given to wine. That is how the aged women are supposed to be. And why are these aged women required to be holy, they are required not to give in themselves to wine or not to be a false accuser. So, so that they will be able to teach the younger women. And what are they supposed to teach the younger women? We see it in uh, verse 5. The aged women are supposed to teach the younger women to be sober. And then if they are married, that they love their husbands, they love their children. Now, basically, whenever we love somebody, be it our children, our husbands, our, our wives, our colleagues, or whoever they might be, we usually put that into an action. Okay, And then we always try to make sure that everything good happens to them. So therefore, what is this aged women are uh, supposed to do is they're supposed to teach the young women to love their husbands. They, when you love somebody, you try to be very obedient to them. And when you're obedient to somebody, everything happens in a very uh, systematic manner or maybe there couldn't be any quarrels of that sort. So, so therefore, they're supposed to teach them to love their husbands. They're supposed to love their children. When you love your children, you will be training them in the way that they're supposed to walk. So that is what is just meant to say that they're supposed to love their children. They're supposed to be disgraced, chased, and then keep us at home good and obedient to their own husbands. Now, if we try to uh, what is a, give a particular term to all these qualities that the young women uh, are supposed to have, they're supposed to have love. Love brings everything. So that is what the aged women are admonished or they are um, instructed by Titus to instruct those young women to keep up with those particular qualities. So that is what we see in verses 3 to 5. And then coming to the instructions that are supposed to be given to the young women, we say it in six to eight verses. These are also supposed to be sober-minded. They're supposed to do good works. And then their doctrine is supposed to be uncorruptness. They're not supposed to be corrupt. They're supposed to be uh, have gravity, sincerity, and then they're supposed to be in sound speech. Now, to tell these young women to have all these qualities, the aged women are supposed to follow those qualities. So therefore, highest preference of responsibility is being given to the aged women aged women as well as the aged men only when they follow the younger ones will definitely follow them so that is how the aged women are supposed to put up their qualities and then coming to the servants servants we see it in verse 9 and 10 they're supposed to be obedient to their masters now whenever we are obedient to god we do not have to fear of uh, have fear of punishments that is what Paul is trying to actually uh, mean over here. The servants, if they're obedient to their masters, they do not have to worry. They're not, they, do, they do not have to have fear over their masters. They do not have to become anxious of what, what would be the next step of their masters, only if they are very obedient to them. And then they're supposed to please them. Uh, whoever the master is, like we all know, nobody can serve two masters. So any servant who is under a master he's supposed to have one master and he's supposed to please that particular master and the other thing is not answer again now basically we have um, now maybe pertaining to my uh, particular profession 
now since i am in teaching field i would definitely would not want my students to answer me again or answer me back so that is how the servants are supposed to be they are not supposed to answer back to their masters they are supposed to listen be obedient to them that's it that is what uh, paul is trying to say when we put it in a uh, spiritual way we are servants of god whatever god is saying we are supposed to follow it we have no other way we are supposed to be obedient to all that god is trying to tell us and then not be per learning they are supposed to be fed uh, fedel meaning they are supposed to be very honest to their masters and then they are supposed to adopt the doctrine of god they are supposed to wear the doctrine of god and then follow it not just adopt themselves with the doctrine but also to put that into practice so those are the admonitions that are being given by paul to instruct the aged women the aged men so that they will be teaching their young women young men and also the servants to be able to put up this qualities so that is about a chapter 2 and then we move on to the last chapter of uh, titus chapter 3 now this chapter 3 like i've already made a mention this is a combination of chapter 1 and chapter 2 now in uh, chapter 3 there are uh, overall instructions that are being given to the people in crete and then a little bit as paul ends his letter there are some instructions that were also given to titus so first we'll try to understand the instructions that were given to um, the people of crete now in verse 1 verse 1 begins with put them in mind put them in mind so that means in another word it says it could be remind them when do we actually try to remind when we know somebody might forget it or when we know that somebody forgot it we try to remind them this is the time you're supposed to do the that is the time, that is where you're supposed to go this is what you're supposed to do only when somebody is forgetting or somebody might forget is when we try to remind them so what paul is trying to uh, mean over here is these are those people who are christians they profess themselves to be christians but they're not able to acknowledge the truth and then there is lot of deception like they have professed uh, testified of themselves there is deception going on false teachings were going on they were sticking on to the law of moses trying to follow the jewish fables that were already there so keeping that in mind Uh, paul is saying you remind to them what to remind to those christians so verses 1 and 2 tells us what titus is supposed to remind to those people in crete they're supposed to be subject to principalities and powers meaning they're supposed to be submissive to the elders that are there in that particular area of crete so this means paul has observed that people in crete were not submissive to the powers and principalities that were uh, existing in the island of crete so therefore he's telling you remind to them remind to them that they are supposed to be submissive to those authorities and then obey the magistrates so this is also says the authorities are supposed to be obeyed everybody is supposed to obey them and then they are supposed to be ready to every good work now this means they were not ready to every good work okay that is why paul is saying let them remind to them or tell them you rebuke them that they were not ready for every good work that they have to be ready now and then speak evil of no man i think that is something that we are supposed to take it seriously and then they are not supposed to be brawlers they are supposed to be very gentle and meek now these uh, last two things the gentle and meek when paul is saying you remind them that they are supposed to be gentle and meek this means they were not gentle they were not humble while paul was there in the island of crete so these are the uh, reminders or these are some things that paul is trying to tell titus to remind to those individuals and then he is also saying you rebuke them do not just remind them you also rebuke them so all responsibility is given to titus to rebuke those people that are there in crete okay so that was uh, the reminder or that was the rebuking that titus is supposed to do the people to the people of the and then something very fascinating in this uh, titus is paul is not actually uh, letting titus know that he and titus are very very good he is not letting uh, putting in the mind of titus that we are all very holy this is what we are supposed to tell to the other individuals he is saying to titus 
you also remember how we were once. I think I'll just read that uh, verse, Titus 3, verse 3 says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceiving, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So that is really nice. Now, basically, whenever we try to counsel somebody, we don't actually tell them the kind of life that we lead to. Maybe I do not want to tell somebody I was also foolish. You don't be foolish of that sort. But here Paul is uh, telling Titus, you don't uh, go above your thoughts. We were also once in this manner, meaning we were also like the people of Crete. So since we have been saved by grace, how are we saved by grace? The mercy of God was shown to all of us through the crucifixion, through uh, the sacrifice that was done by Christ. I, I think we see that uh, verse in chapter, I'm sorry, that uh, verse in verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. So he, he is also, Paul is also trying to remind Titus and saying, don't you think that all those people are very, very bad? Even we were bad, we were bad, but we have been saved through mercy. So that is what you're supposed to tell to those people in Crete that if you are obedient to God, that you will also be saved through grace or saved through mercy. So that is a reminder or that is one thing that Paul is trying to remind to Titus over there. Now he comes to the, going to the end portion of this uh, letter. Tit uh, Paul is giving some instruction to Titus. So what was Titus supposed to do? His, he was supposed to elect the leaders keeping in mind the qualities that the leaders are supposed to have. He was supposed to teach or give instructions to those young women, the uh, the aged men and all the servants. He was also supposed to remind and rebuke the individuals. But personally, some instructions were also given to Titus. What were those instructions that were given? We see it in verse 9 to 14. Avoid foolish questions. When you're going to talk to these people of Crete, these people of Crete, they are Christians, they are Christians who follow the law of Moses and they have a lot of questions to pose over you. Avoid all those questions. That is what Paul is trying to say. Avoid those genealogies, the contentions, strivings about the law, all the law that they would try to speak to you. You avoid them because they're not going to be profitable to you. That is what. That is why he's saying you avoid all such kind of things that might happen when you try to admonish, and admonish or instruct those people of Crete. And then uh, the next thing he's saying is, you give admonish admonition for the first time, you give instructions for the first time and see if they're accepting. If there is any man that is not accepting and very heretic to your admo admonition, you reject that man. That is what uh, Paul is uh, telling to Titus. So Titus is supposed to take up that responsibility at least four, two times. First time he's supposed to say it, Check if the men are able to accept the admonition, not able to accept, say it for the second time and also check whether they're accepting that admonition. Once Titus finds that the men are the men or the women in that particular place of Crete are not accepting the admonition that is being given to them, Titus is supposed to reject them, meaning not go for a third time to start admonishing, admonishing those people. That is the personal um, uh, instruction that was given to Titus. And finally, uh, Paul says, when, when you're going to come to Nicopolis, now Paul is telling in his letter, you have to come to Nicopolis because after this, uh, pri priorly Paul and Titus were there together ministering, Paul had to go to Nicopolis and he also wanted Titus to come back to Nicopolis. So what was he saying is, bring Zenos, there was a lawyer okay, in the uh, place of it, there was a lawyer called as Zenus. So he tells Titus, when you come to Nicopolis, you try to bring a Zenus and then Apollos along with you. And the other was uh, in the verse it says, I will send Artemis or Tychicus. This means when Paul, after Paul has written the letter, he has actually sent the letter either to Artemis or Tychicus. We are not sure. The Bible doesn't uh, make it clear who has taken that letter. But that was what uh, was made in, made a mention. I will either send Artemis or I will either send Tychicus. And then at the end, what um, 
instruction or what reminder Paul is trying to give to Titus, uh, Titus is, let us also learn how to make it fruitful. I think that is there in uh, verse 12. In verse 12, there is a verse there that they let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they may not be unfruitful. So what is uh, Paul trying to say is when you are going to admonish the people, you also take up lessons from them or you also take up the lessons that you're going to give to those individuals. So sometimes when we give advices, we are also supposed to put that into practice. So that is what Paul is trying to say. So meaning we have the word when we give a word or when we uh, uh, preach the gospel, we are not just to be preachers. We are also supposed to be the doers of the word. That is how or that is what Paul is trying to tell Titus. So he's saying whatever you're going to do over there, learn from it so that everything will, will become fruitful. So when it becomes fruit, uh, fruitful, all glory can be given to the Almighty. So that is... Uh, the letter that was written by Paul to Titus. And finally, how is Paul concluding? Like I've already made a mention, he was having the order. He was introducing, he introduced himself, he addressed to the person that he's writing. He had a body matter. And then he's concluding. How is Paul concluding? He's saying, all that are with me salute thee. There were some individuals that were there. I think um, based on what we see in the Bible, Tychicus uh, was there and then Artemis was there. Either of them were there. So he said, Paul is saying, all those who are there with me are saluting you. And then we want to greet all of them that love us in faith. Now, who are all these, all of them? These are all those people in Crete who loved Paul when Paul was there in the island of Crete. And then grace be with all of you. I mean, that is how Paul is concluding his uh, letter. So this is about a Titus. So chapter one is about how they're supposed to elect the leaders. Chapter two was the admonition that is supposed to be given to every single age group individuals. And then chapter three, he is making a mention of what to remind to those uh, people in the creed and how we have been saved by grace. What is the blessed hope that they also might have if they are obedient to God. And then he is ending his letter with a um, graceful note. So some lessons that we could learn from the book of Titus, we are supposed to appoint godly men as elders. Maybe as of now, we might be little to appoint elders, but maybe to those individuals who have that opportunity, you are supposed to appoint godly men as elders. Why does it make a mention godly men? You're not supposed to look into what is the skill of an individual, what is the position of an individual, or what is the background of an individual but look into whether that particular individual whom we are going to select has all those qualities that are supposed to be there, whatever we have studied, whether those qualities are there in that particular individuals or not. And then we are also supposed to disciple all ages and genders. We, can, we are not small to pass on the word of God. God never said, this is the age group individuals who are supposed to spread my word. A little child can spread the word of God. Uh, maybe we could uh, we can remind ourselves of a verse in uh, what to say uh, Psalm. It says, "I will let the babies speak." So God has all the power to let anybody speak. So that is how what we are supposed to learn. We are supposed to disciple all the people, all the age group people. Do not stay back saying I am very small. Do not stay back. I am very aged. I have had my life. There is nothing to do with me with the youngsters, but we are supposed to take up that responsibility as the Christians. And then all glory, glory in grace of God. We are supposed to give glory in the grace of God because only through grace, not by our righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy right. So God, what we learn from here is do not boast in your righteousness. None of us are righteous. We all know there is nobody righteous except God. So we are not supposed to boast in our spirituality, but give all glory because of the grace that he has shown to all of us. And finally, we are supposed to teach devotion to good works. Okay, Whomever we come across, we could be Christians, we could be young, we could be uh, older, or we could be elder. 
whatever we teach to the other individuals or the instructions that we give to the other individuals, we are supposed to teach them to do good works. What can be those good works? Maybe like simple things such as visiting the sick, reaching out to the needy, visiting the uh, widows. We have that verse somewhere in uh, James and all, what we are supposed to do to be a true Christian. So those are the good works that we are supposed to practice in our lives. I think uh, from this uh, Titus, I have one uh, verse that really struck me was this verse, Titus 1, verse 1 to one. I'm sorry, Titus 1, verse 16. They profess to know that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work, a reprobate. Now, the, uh, maybe I would call it a lie. We, are, we all deceive ourselves. We all deceive ourselves. Stating that we know God. I know God. I definitely know God. But in the walk of my life, maybe I'm abominable. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm disobedient in some areas where I'm supposed to actually obey God. I'm not obedient. So that is uh, the a very strong thing that Paul is trying to say. These are not only the Christians that are there in creed that they're professing to know God. This is to every Christian. Every Christian they just profess, they profess that they know God, but they're not putting that into practice. What, what we know God to be is entirely different from what we are actually leading in our life. So that is how we are not supposed to be. And uh, maybe to conclude, I would say from, uh, to summarize this book of Titus, the complete conclusion that comes to us is be holy for I am holy. Peter 1 verse 16 says be holy. That is what we have seen. These are the qualities that the particular individuals should have. These are the qualities that the women or the men are supposed to have. And then finally we are supposed to be holy. Why are we supposed to be holy? Because God says I am holy or you are also supposed to be holy. That is the only way through which we could uh, gain the eternal life when God comes the second time. So that is about the book of Titus. Thank you.